Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to be talking about the consumer perspective um, in, in all of this, and I've got five themes to share with you today. And, and these are five themes that are shaping the way that the consumer, and I'm talking about the global consumer here, sees the kind of landscape for, for kind of food and agriculture. Um, <clears throat> So as I said, I have five themes for you. The first is about, about the economy and about the divergence that we see currently in economic prospects globally. Um, and the second is, in a way, how consumers are coping with that, so how they are searching for value in their kind of everyday lives and how shopping for food, how they're looking to get value out of food. The, the, the third uh, touches on the consumer aspect of, of what we've heard about kind of sustainability. So there's a kind of match up with the presentation you just heard. And the fourth then is talking about, okay, in, in people's lives nowadays, as people are coping with the stresses of kind of on the go lives, how they're going about that and what they're looking for. Uh, and the, the, the fifth topic is about health and wellness and how consumers are, go, are using food to help them manage health and wellness. And, and lastly, just some thoughts for the kind of implications of this for Irish food. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm having the same problem other people had. Perfect, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So, as the introduction said, uh, I work for the Futures Company. Um, people formerly know us as, as uh, Henley Center. It became Henley Center Headlight Vision. Then we merged with a company called Yankalovich. That was all going to get far too much of a mouthful um, as a brand name, so we rebranded as the Futures Company. Um, but we have a long history of looking at consumer lifestyle and societal trends going back kind of 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, Yankalovich were the first uh, organization to term the to, to coin the term baby boomers in the US. Um, and you know, we, we've spent a long time analyzing how society is developing and how consumers are developing. Um, and what we do is we apply that knowledge um, to help organizations, some of which you see up there, to unlock future opportunities um, for growth. Um, uh, so that, that's what we do. And we have a long uh, working relationship with Board Beer. Um, we've worked kind of five plus years with Board Beer, again, helping them better connect with con the consumer, working out what the consumer wants, and, and working out how you communicate that um, to their stakeholders to help unlock opportunities. So moving on to my first uh, theme then. Um, <clears throat> and what we see is that consumers currently, globally, are kind of facing a moment of transition. Um, there, there was kind of, up until two or three years ago, consumers were, were, were kind of feeling that um, there was a long kind of global boom and everything was certain, um, that the prices of basic goods uh, were falling. One of the previous presentations was showing the kind of fall in the price of food and the cost of food. People felt that their spending power was increasing and they were operating in an environment where they had increased choice and empowerment. So they felt that, that, that the consumer was in control and the consumer could choose. But, but uh, exacerbated by the, the, the financial crisis of 2008, a lot of these assumptions are being challenged. So consumers are seeing actually the price of basic goods is, is rising rapidly and suddenly they're finding that their spending power um, is much more constrained and, and as a result, they're feeling less empowered and they're having less choice. Um, and so we're seeing a kind of new world opening up for consumers. But what's interesting is the old world's still in place. It's not as if we've kind of suddenly flipped a coin and everything's changed. People are still working on some of the kind of assumptions of the old model. Um, <clears throat> but, but what we see then is a kind of moment of transition um, in, in that some people feel they're doing better out of this and some people are feeling they're a lot worse. And, and what we're seeing is they're kind of divergent opportunities for consumers um, in this new landscape. <clears throat> and firstly, there's kind of divergent by different geographies. So we do a study um, called Global Monitor, and that looks at consumer attitudes in 20 different markets around the world. Um, and, and what we have done is analyzing that data, we can put consumers in, 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 the, in these 20 markets into kind of three broad buckets. And the first bucket is, is those at the top um, who feel that the economic conditions mean that they feel stressed and they're struggling to cope. 
Um, and this is a kind of broadly looking at the consumer, but, but we see that, that there are countries like Ireland, like France, Spain, Italy, and Japan who are in this bucket. And, and they're, they're facing real changes to their everyday lives. When I do qualitative research, when I go out and speak to consumers in some of these markets, you find that the state of the economy dominates some of the, con the conversation. So I was in Ireland a few months ago um, talking about people's choice of drinks and people were telling me um, that you know, the economy is really shaping the way that they drink, and people talking about drinking a lot more at home, going out less often, but also just you know, the, the, the way that they're kind of trying to look value. Price is very important, um, but they're looking for value in very different ways. So, so, so people feel that it's quite difficult to cope. They're having to make big kind of lifestyle changes. Then there are a group in the middle who we're calling, the, they're a bit cautious and uncertain about the future. Uh, so this is some of the big, you know, the US, Germany, the UK, but also Russia, Mexico, and Colombia are in this group. Um, and there, people have been affected materially by the, by the global downturn, and people are really feeling the effects of it. But often it's actually their kind of perceptions of it. They feel that they should be doing something different, or it's, it's changed their thinking more than their behavior. So they're cautious and they're uncertain. So they're putting off kind of big purchases. They're thinking about what they do differently even if they don't feel very much worse off. And then there's a third group. The third group are, are hopeful and optimistic. They're people who haven't necessarily seen the downturn because of the state of their economy, or just they're in a big growth phase. So here we see the kind of big markets of, of Brazil and China, um, but also places like Turkey uh, and South Korea and, and Australia, which has, been, um, which has been sheltered from some of the worst effects of the recession. And here people actually are seeing there's great opportunity while there's kind of been a, a more kind of depressed place for some other consumers, they're feeling much more hopeful about the future and they're feeling optimistic that both their country's economy will grow but also personally that their own spending power and their financial position will improve over the next few years. So there's a great kind of disparity by geography in the way that consumers uh, are facing the recession. There's also disparity in terms of age cohorts. So um, the 50 plus age group, when we look at them, although there are obviously people who have been affected by the recession, um, that group have been affected far less. So they have more discretionary income than any other demographic. And so they've been sheltered on the whole that they've made their wealth. They own property. They feel more comfortable uh, in, in, in kind of thinking about the future. When we look at the kind of younger age cohort, so people who've uh, kind of in their uh, kind of late teens and early twenties, it's affected this age cohort much in a much greater way. So, looking at 17 countries in the eurozone, joblessness amongst the young is at 20 percent in January 2001, which is up over five percentage points um, since February 2008, before the kind of financial crisis really hit. And we have talked from commentators about a new lost generation of consumers who face rising house prices, less access to credit, who face uh, big debts uh, from, from, being, from their studies, from being a student, and a kind of inability to get jobs now. And that there is a real kind of worry that there will be this lost generation who have very kind of poor, poor prospects and will be paying debt, back debt for a long, long time to come. So there's, there's disparity in age cohorts. Um, what we also see is in, within, even within markets, so within the UK, within Ireland, um, people feel differently about this. So this is, this is um, some data from a study that we've done, uh, in, in fact, in conjunction with Board Beer, um, called Feeling the Pinch. So it's examined people's responses to the economic downturn. Um, and we've, we, we see that um, People in Ireland and in Great Britain, we asked them, how will your spending over the next 12 months change compared with last year? And to be honest, the picture is not a particularly pretty one if you're a kind of producer of, of, of consumer goods, in that the majority of consumers think that their spending will stay the same or probably decrease a little or a lot. Um, there is only a small proportion of consumers, both in Ireland uh, and in the UK, who think over the next 12 months their spending um, is going to increase. So even, even if in the reality doesn't match this, people just feel that their spending power um, is, is, is going down rather than going up. 
But what, what does this mean for food? What does this mean for food manufacturers? I think what the, the, the kind of key bit that, that we see is consumers are not just looking for the cheapest price. Um, consumers are finding new ways of coping with this new condition. People are scrutinizing the value that food brings to their lives and what they're getting for their money. So they're looking much more carefully um, about doing, which brings on, me on to uh, my second theme, um, which is about um, people searching for value. And, and, and more than ever, consumers are looking to get the best possible value out of the money that they spend. We're still in, living in an era uh, where kind of the access to the choice we have is much greater. A lot of this is, is driven by technological, technological advancement, which means that we have access to a huge amount more information, but we, we can buy goods from around the world much more easily. Um, so consumers still do feel kind of more empowered to make their own choices and they're finding out a lot more and they're, that, that they're able to really assess value in many different ways than they were before. So deciding what actually represents good value in the food you buy becomes a lot more complex question and the, 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 there remains a kind of relationship between quality and price but people look at things like trust and familiarity, but also looking at things like provenance and wider environmental and social concerns. These now become much part of a much richer value equation. And there is still room for luxury. One of the things that, that, that we've seen in many different markets, actually, is that people are putting off the big treats, like going on expensive holidays and uh, spending their money on smaller treats. One of the things is, is that kind of food and drink for many people represents one of those smaller treats. It's a way of connecting with the family. It's a way of connecting with friends and actually enjoying yourself uh, in a fairly kind of rooted, uh, down-to-earth way. So there is still kind of room for luxury and indulgence. Um, it's just that people aren't doing it with such kind of abandon as they were before. What we're seeing, actually, is that, that, that consumers want to be in more control of what they're buying. They want to search value much more readily. Um, and people find themselves thinking twice about making even the smallest day-to-day -day purchases. So 70% of Irish consumers agreeing with that and 62% of British consumers. And we see this in the way that people shop. People are looking much more carefully about the price of things. And they're using things like technology to, to help them do so. So we're seeing the, you know, the, the rise of the iPhone app, which helps you compare prices um, across different supermarkets. Um, people are looking for value in lots of different ways. People are looking to, to, to club together to buy things. The phenomenon of Groupon in the UK is huge in that people are looking to kind of collectively get the best prices. So there are lots of ways in which technology is helping people seek better value out of what they do. People are also then looking for things that are more personalized. They're looking for value that's going to be personal to them so they can be sure that they're going to get great value out of the products that they buy. So this example is from, from kettle ship, chips in the UK. And it, it's, a, it's a kit for making your own crisps. It's saying you, you can mix the flavor how you want. So it's introducing a bit of a playful, fun element um, to what otherwise might be a more standard purchase. But it's saying that you can personalize it, but you're going to have fun. It makes it more of a complete experience. So I'm getting much more value rather than just the food value out of this purchase. It's encompassing a lot of different uh, elements of value. There are also kind of encouraging signs uh, for the food industry. Um, we asked people about a question, if my finances improve in the, last 12, in, the next, sorry, in the next 12 months, what are you likely to spend more on? When we're looking at the grocery shopping arena, 49% um, of consumers say that if their finances improve, they're going to buy more expensive cuts of meat. It's again, it's just kind of one of those simple everyday luxuries that people feel that they're holding back at the moment, but if their finances improve, um, you know, that, 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 that's one of the things that, that they feel that they're going to spend on. Before everybody gets too excited about that, bear in mind that, that there was only 12% of consumers who felt that their finances were going to improve um, in the next 12 months. Um, so, on to my next theme, which is about sustainability of consumption. People are, are increasingly aware, and this is partly just the, the information that, that, that's available to them, about the kind of issues of sustainability, the impact that consumer culture has on the environment, and kind of the social concerns. 
Um, and, and a lot of people have speculated that the, the economic crisis would change this, that people would forget about it all of a sudden. And what we've seen is it hasn't gone away at all. The focus that people have might have changed a little bit, but it's still there and it still matters a lot to consumers. Uh, and what's happening is often that, that um, consumers are hoping that the companies that they buy from and the companies that they deal with will help them make more of these choices. So it won't be so, but won't be so much down to them just to spend more money or, or make the effort in this. And they're looking for people who will partner with them and help them make more sustainable choices, thinking about the impacts both globally but also on their local community. And one of the things that, that, that we've seen is that people's environmental concern has often become more local um, as, uh, as the kind of recessions hit. Um, but also what we've, we, what we've seen is that, that there are people also who kind of think about sustainability choices as good ways and smart ways of saving money and, and, and making better value judgments. That there is a kind of big word of caution here that, that um, alongside this uh, skepticism is rising and there is an increased need for more proof of environmental credentials. So we asked people a, a question in one of our studies, I don't believe the claims made by environmentally friendly products. And what we've seen is across different regions, so across Asia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, North America, uh, and, and also in Latin America, this is on the rise. So people don't say that they're saying that they don't believe the claims made by environmental, environmentally friendly products, that, that people have seen a lot of greenwash and they're looking for people to back up their claims um, with information and for those claims um, to be kind of transparent and obvious to them. But what we do see is that the companies that make it easier for people to, to, to make green choices um, are proving very popular to customers. So, so reducing waste is an area that people often think of first off. Um, and an example here uh, from Moss Burger, which is a Japanese burger chain. Now, th th this chain is an interesting example because it links a lot of the messages around uh, kind of more healthy choices um, with sustainable concerns as well. So it talks about kind of um, healthier choices of food, but also looking, around, uh, looking after the, the, the wider environment. So it talks about the sustainability and, and the recyclability of all its packaging um, and all of its waste so that it has a minimal environmental impact. Um, the, the other kind of way that, that, that organizations are helping people make good choices are through supporting local good causes. So this is just an example from the UK. Um, the supermarket Waitrose um, allocates £1,000 per month uh, to each store, but then, then um, encourages consumers to get uh, involved in, the, in how this money is allocated. So you have a green bin and you put a coin in that, and that represents where, where the money will go to that month. It involves people more directly so that they feel through their shopping they are kind of helping their local community, even if it is just in, in a fairly simple and small way. My fourth theme is about um, consumers' lives. So they're looking to cope with the demands of on-the-go, hectic lives. So one of the, the responses to the recession that we've seen is that consumers are putting their head down and working hard, uh, and, and, and they're kind of struggling to en make ends meet. And th this often means that, that, that they have less time to do some of the kind of basics, um, and so they're looking for kind of convenient solutions, or at least solutions that, that kind of fit into busy, non-stop lives. Um, and some of those things that, that, that we've seen, um, and this on the left is an example uh, f from, from Russia, um, is a kind of, is the middle ground of convenience. So, so this is from Campbell Soup, who was saying, we're not going to try and sell you completely, you know, homemade soup because they realize that one of the pleasures that Russian consumers have is making soup themselves, but we're not going to give you um, just a bunch of raw ingredients. And so th th this is the kind of base um, for a soup that Russian consumers are using, using a lot of. So it's kind of not ultimate convenience, but it's not making from scratch. It's that kind of middle ground. Um, other ways that, 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 that companies are responding to this, um, this is a kind of, uh, a, 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 almost the kind of opposite of Red Bull. People were talking about Red Bull in terms of energy management earlier. This is the antidote to Red Bull. So this is something that doesn't help you speed up. This is something that helps you slow down. Um, and, and we're seeing increasing numbers of these products that are in the kind of energy man management space, whereas previously there was lots and lots of about giving you more energy. This was helping people unwind at the end of the day, um, and people are looking for solutions like that. Um, <clears throat> and finally, um, 
people are looking kind of at the impact that, they, that these lifestyles have on their health and wellness. They're looking for, 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 for help uh, in finding foods that help them manage um, their day-to-day -day health. People want to be more in control of their health and to manage it, manage it and improve it through making better choices. And, 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 and as kind of the costs um, of healthcare increase, um, as more and more of that is pushed onto the individual, people are using food as a, as a way of managing this more and more. Um, but managing these choices becomes more complex. It's really difficult for people to do. Um, they're bombarded with messages about what food is good to them and what they should eat to help their, manage their health in the short term, but also um, in the long term. And it's the products that really help um, consumers navigate that that are doing well. So there's examples of, of things that help people boost the body. So um, somebody referenced in Innocent um, earlier, and obviously they've done very well in providing that kind of ultimate convenience uh, health food, um, the smoothie. They've extended that, and this is um, Innocent 5 for 5 Cafe, and they're offering people a, a whole range of food that helps you get your five a day um, that you can all eat in one cafe. Um, <coughs> Whether people, that means that people go out and eat what they like after that, I don't quite know. But um, it, it, it's kind of tapping in that friend, into that, that, that uh, trend of making it easier for people. Similarly, uh, Haag and Das um, ha have, have looked at a way of doing this about, um, about stressing its kind of natural, pure, and fresh ingredients. So Haag and Das 5 says this, this ice cream just has five ingredients in it. And so they're trying to make it kind of seem more simple. This is not about saying it's health food, but saying about if you're going to indulge, make sure it's natural and make sure that the harm that it might do you um, is, is minimized. Um, so so what, what does this say for Irish food? Um, we, we recently uh, did a study looking at kind of perceptions of Irish food um, but in, in, in the UK, and the kind of findings match up very much with, with what Aidan was talking about earlier and that, that people's perceptions of Irish food amongst, US, amongst UK consumers are very positive. And I read this data in two ways. The, the, the first way says it's, it's, it's hugely positive. So lots of the, the things that consumers are looking for, made with traditional ingredients and processes, it's food that tastes great, it has high production standards and good value for money, and it's simple food. Those are the things that people tell us again and again that they're looking for. So Irish food has a great starting point. The, the kind of flip side of that is that we had 30% of, uh, of our respondents who said, well, none of that applies. I don't know what Irish food stands for. And it says to me that, that there, there are lots of positive uh, associations with Irish food, but they're not all that strong. Um, and in, in, you know, in the UK, in Ireland's closest neighbour, a lot of people can't really talk about what the real benefits um, of Irish food are. Um, and if you kind of extrapolate that more globally, I think there's a job in pr promoting some of those very positive attributes um, more globally to um, consumers around the world, because it is what consumers tell us that they are looking for. Um, <clears throat> so kind of three challenges for Irish food. The, the first is knowing which consumers to target knowing which consumers geographically, also demographically and by lifestyle, knowing what their priorities are, what they're looking for from their food. Um, the, the second challenge is about helping cu customers navigate, navigate some of those tricky choices, help show consumers that they're getting, getting good value for their money, and value for money isn't just about the price for the food that they get, but also showing consumers about how you're helping them navigate some of those tricky choices around sustainability and showing them about those tricky choices, difficult choices around health. Um, and, the, and the third challenge really is kind of emphasizing the consumer benefits and the true value of Irish food. So it's, all, you know, it's very well saying Ireland, Irish food becomes from this kind of green and beautiful land where the population is convivial, but what does that mean when I'm putting the food um, on the table for my family? How is that translating um, into, into benefits that I'm gonna feel every day? So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.